Here we go. Last week, we left off talking about Freemasonry as a tradition in which natural law and morality is taught through a system of symbols, allegories, and rituals. And we highlighted that what an allegory really is, is a story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal hidden meanings, typically moral or political meanings. So Freemasonry is a veiled tradition that, through its symbols and its allegories, attempts to get the person being taught to understand the deeper symbolic significances of these symbols and these allegorical tales in order to learn about themselves and in order to learn about natural law. Now, again, uh, I thought I made this abundantly clear, almost to the point of boredom last week, that what I was attempting to explain here is not what necessarily may be going on in the Lodge system of Freemasonry, but instead that I would be explaining the esoteric underlying tradition of this tradition, okay? The esoteric underlying teachings of this tradition. I still get people emailing or, you know, telling me that they think Freemasonry is all one thing. And I thought I explained that to a degree of almost, you know, uh, wearing it out, that there is a unadulterated version of Freemasonry, and then there is one that has been perverted and watered down over time, and that largely is what is being taught and received in the Lodge system in the current day. This has been warned about um, ad infinitum. It has been warned about by different Masonic authors, okay? Uh, notably, I could think of two that warned of this watering down of this tradition and that this would have to be watched for. Manly P. Hall certainly did, and also Albert Churchward, who really w delved into this um, uh, watering down and perversion of the Masonic tradition in his book, Origins of Freemasonry. Now, that brings me to my next point. For people that really want to go deeper into this, because again, I can't possibly cover every aspect of something as big as the Freemasonic tradition, I'd refer you to my website where you'll get a good jumping off point, okay? You'll get a good introductory basis to Freemasonry through some of the books that I posted in the podcast for last week. So I want to refer you to the site for two reasons. The first is to show you on the podcast page uh, last week's show, show number 52, on that podcast I posted, along with the MP3 file, a great number of Masonic books. For people who want to do further research, you can uh, uh, read these books online. Uh, if you join up to Scribed and upload, you know, you could download them and keep them or print them, do whatever you want with them. And there's a really good small library right there of the Masonic tradition uh, written by initiates of this tradition and has a, it has a wealth of knowledge in those in those book, books. So I ask people to avail themselves of that information and again there will be so many references in those works alone. You, it's a lifetime of study uh, in the all, all the interconnections that would go along with even looking into one of those books. So I think I posted something like 13 or 14 books up there at least. So check them out and uh, make good use of them. Uh, the second reason I want you to go to the site, whatonearthishappening.com, is to look at the images for tonight's show. Those are on the radio listen page when you click the listen live uh, button on the left hand side of the site if you're not already there. Um, underneath the player you'll see images for tonight's show for March 29th, 2011. And um, there are 13 images there. Now, last week, we left off with images one and two. At the beginning last week of the second hour, I was explaining the structure of Freemasonry, the general structure, um, and how this is based in hierarchy and compartmentalization, as is almost every other institution on the earth. 
and this is one of the dangers of the lodge system of Freemasonry. Again, not the deep esoteric underlying meaning or purpose of the symbol and allegory that is contained in this tradition, but the organization of it, the official organizing bodies of Freemasonry. Okay, This is the same thing that we talked about when we talked about religion, that the deep esoteric mystery tradition that underlies religion is all teaching the same basic concepts and it's teaching understanding of self and generally the golden rule that as you wish to be treated you should treat others period okay underlying all of those religions is are those deep esoteric truths however in the formulation of official religions you get structures you get hierarchies you get comp compartmentalized units and denominations etc and so forth and in doing that it creates political aspects to this and therefore you have power plays go on you have the watering down of the tradition you have the hoarding and keeping of knowledge and the you know misinterpretations and misdirection that go along with all of those things that is the religious aspect you know misinterpretations and misdirection that go along with all of those things that is the religious aspect of religion and this relates to the structures that are existing within Freemasonry and the Masonic tradition again I don't want to get bogged down in that for what I'm attempting to get the listener to comprehend I'm attempting to teach what is generally known as light Freemasonry okay true Freemasonry all right just like I was explaining the esoteric traditions of Kabbalah and Tarot that's what this is about this isn't telling anybody to go and join a Masonic Lodge all right I wouldn't advocate that as a matter of fact because I believe that it has largely become some sort of just a network of people to come together and you know try to figure out you know w ways of scratching the other person's back so that when their back needs scratching someone else will do it and that again ties into all kinds of political motivations and all kinds of motivations in business money and really all of those things do not belong in the lodge system at all it's supposed to be about learning natural law and morality ultimately and it has become something quite other than that and as a matter of fact you know when you get enough psychopathic people together in a lodge system um, through the secrecy that is inherent to the lodge system itself you can get completely dark Masonic lodges that are really doing things that you know they're not chartered to do they have no business doing and are completely against other people's natural rights and I don't doubt that that goes on it certainly does in certain places however again what I am attempting to explain and I don't know how I can make this any clearer for people that don't get what I'm saying just turn off the show now and believe what you want okay because I can't possibly you know hammer this any more than I already have without you know belaboring this to a, to an unbearable point I am not attempting to teach the compartmentalized slash hierarchical structure of Freemasonry as it is in the lodge system I am teaching the underlying esoteric meanings of the allegories and symbols that is what I hope to convey and that's all I can say I can't say anything more than that uh, to try to get you to understand what I'm trying to do by explaining this so if you think it's all bad and evil turn the show off and believe what you want okay period so with that having been said let's go into our continued exploration of some of the symbols meanings and allegories that are contained within the Freemasonic tradition now, th this just just generally conveys what needs to be done to try to counter one-dimensional thinking and this has been talked about by many people many researchers in different uh, areas of what's going on uh, people generally think along one-dimensional terms and think that the first thing they ever hear or see about something is all there is to it and that's not the case 
There, there are two sides to the coin when it comes to understanding what the Freemasonic tradition is about and how it has been used. Okay, so we can, uh, you know, believe all of the hype that's out there about what it actually is versus understanding that what it is is different than how it has been used. Okay. And that's what I'm trying to get people to understand is what it originally was intended to be versus what it has become. All right. So what we're looking at here is what it is originally intended to be and attempting to get people to understand the unadulterated teachings within this tradition. And I, I, I will not say any more about this because, again, the point has been belabored. If you don't understand that, I can't help you. So that having been said, here we go. We looked at the structure. We started looking at one of its symbols, and this is the most well-known symbol of the tradition. The compass is in the square with the G in the middle of it. I put a couple of stylized renderings of this up on the site. Uh, this is image number two and three, if you were in, at the image section for tonight's show. And um, you see um, the, the square at the bottom on its point and that's important in that configuration what that represents versus in the inverted form which we'll get to okay um, the square as we talked about last week represents lower consciousness it represents base consciousness instinct it would be the equivalent of the R complex of the brain okay in physiological terms okay because ultimately what Freemasonry is all ultimately about is how to build a better brain it's how to build a better person through building a better brain and heart within the person. Okay? That's ultimately what the craft is constructing. That's why it's called a craft. Okay? It's making something. And the, the concept or the principle of making is contained deeply within this tradition, as we're going to see tonight. So the lower aspects of the self need to be ruled by the higher aspects of the self. The lower aspects are physical, world, worldly identification. Okay? They need to be overcome. The, the base passions of the person need to be ruled over if the person is going to obtain self-mastery. That's what this tradition is ultimately about. Self-mastery. Becoming a being that exists in unity consciousness. As you think, so you feel, so you act. And therefore, the number three comes up over and over again in this tradition because it is about these three aspects of consciousness, thought, emotion, and action. Okay? So, if we are going to square our actions, meaning put them into harmony with natural law, okay? Basically, rule our actions, that they're not going to be controlled by other people, okay? We're going to make them upright. We're going to make them in, in harmony with morality, which we talked about in the natural law presentation. If you want to listen to that, go back to podcast number 36. I think people would get a lot from that. I eventually want to record that as a video and get it out there, uh, which, by the way, as a quick aside, I got the video for the Wizard of Oz presentation that I did at one of the Free Your Mind fundraisers at Germ Books up on the website as well. That's in the news section. So check that out as well. But uh, the, the square representing the base instincts needs to be made into something that is more perfected. Okay, It needs to be made into harmony with natural law and the divine aspects of the self, which are embodied in the shape of a circle. The square being the imperfect shape, okay? And the circle being the divine shape. Okay, so we need to circle the square. In other words, the, the, the shape that draws the circle is the compasses, the tool, I should say. All right? This is about geometer's tools. All right? And we talked about the G in the middle representing geometry last week. That's kind of where we left off. What does this G mean? That's where we're going to pick up tonight. All right? So the compasses represent flexibility, not rigidness, right? They represent ruling the passions, okay, the base instincts. 
They represent compassion, coming together in feeling, okay? Understanding we are one, understanding that there is, we all have the same fundamental needs, desires, hopes, dreams, etc., and we're all in this situation together. And that compassion needs to rule over the base instincts of the being, okay? So it, it draws the circle or the divine shape, and you see it depicted here over the square, not just above it vertically, but actually on it. If you look at it as laying these things down, like let's say on a table or something, that the, the compasses are all on top of the square. That's important. They're not under it. The square's not on top of the compasses. It's the other way around. The compasses lay atop the square, okay? Because they are saying, it's symbolically saying, this aspect is superior to and needs to basically be put first over the base instincts. Otherwise, we're going to have chaos, which is what we have now. Okay? The way to get from the compasses, uh, from the square, I should say, to the compasses is through the G, through the center, through the middle, the middle way, the middle path, as we talked about in the Kabbalistic tradition, and we're going to see repeated in the Masonic tradition, there's this concept of the middle path. In, in Kabbalah, we saw it as the middle pillar, okay? The, the pillar of, or the path, the middle path of mildness, which is the middle of the Kabbalistic tree of life, the Sephirotic tree, which we broke down. In Freemasonry, it's the middle pillar, also called Jacob's Ladder, or the pillar of wisdom, okay? So we'll look at that when we break down the first degree tracing board, hopefully later tonight. So these two stylized renderings that I put here with the G in the middle, you can then see um, repeated with the compasses and the square on image number four, having the sun in the middle of it, okay? Because this G represents the light as well, okay? Light is a big symbol in Freemasonry, as is the sun, okay? This sun, again, is higher consciousness. It is the Christ consciousness. It is the solar mind, as, as it has been called. Okay? It is higher level awareness of self, understanding of the true self, awakening, enlightenment, all of these things. Okay? Concepts we've explored at length on this show. All right? Now, the G itself... I gave a general list last week, and let's take them one at a time again. The G in the middle of the compasses and square represents this third aspect of consciousness, which is ultimately our emotions. Okay, If we're going to square our actions into harmony with higher consciousness, which is represented by the compasses, this is higher thought, the higher mind. Okay, The compasses are compassion. Right? Unity consciousness, the left and right brain coming together at the fulcrum point, the place of balance. Okay? It's flexibility and it's harmony. All right? Drawing the circle around the square, the base instincts. All right? The G is the way to that state of higher consciousness, and it's the emotional aspects of self. The inner aspect, see, it's inside. The G is inside. It's not on the outside of the shape. It's inside of it. Looking within. Self-exploration. Understanding the true nature of oneself. Knowing oneself. Gnosis. The G is the first letter of the word gnosis in Greek. In, in Greek, it's gamma, right? Gamma uh, nu, uh, omega, sigma, iota, sigma is how you spell gnosis in Greek. In English, that transliterates to G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, gnosis, knowledge, obtained from direct experience, from going within, okay? It's another thing this G represents. It represents geometry, the allegory of geometric tools, geometers tools being used to create. This is what we create with, our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. The three aspects of consciousness. Okay? It also stands for 
the great architect of the universe, G-A-O-T-U, which you'll see it written as sometimes. Okay? This is God or the goddess, okay? The creator. Doesn't make a difference what you view it as. All right? The creative aspects of everything that underlies everything that we see, that underlies the unity of all. All right? Gnosis, knowledge, goodness, everything that we want to create that ultimately serves us is done through getting in touch with that emotional center. All right? The G, right? I've said this can also represent Gaia, the spirit of the earth plane. All right? The spirit of this school that we are all ultimately in. Okay? And this place for experience and creation. It can also represent green. Green is the balance color in the middle. Again, the G is in the middle. In the middle of the visible spectrum, we find the frequency green. It's the, the color that represents balance, nature, getting into harmony with nature. Green is found abundantly in nature, the most abundant color in nature. It's the love energy color. It's the color ascribed to the heart chakra. Okay? The Anah It can also represent green. Green is the balance color in the middle. Again, the G is in the middle. In the middle of the visible spectrum, we find the, the frequency green. It's the, the color that represents balance, nature, getting into harmony with nature. Green is found abundantly in nature, the most abundant color in nature. It's the love energy color. It's the color ascribed to the heart chakra. Okay? The Anahata chakra, as we looked at when we looked at Kabbalah and the chakra system. So, green is another word that, that could, the G could represent. The gift of life, the gift of compassion, the gift of intelligence, the gift of emotions. Okay, the capacities that we can experience these things in while being human are gifts. It's the gift of the human brain. The three aspects of the human brain correspond to these three symbols in conjunction with each other. Okay, the square, right? The R complex, the G, the midbrain, the mammalian aspect of the brain, the, the emotional brain. Okay, and then the compasses, left and right brain hemis hemisphere the neocortex, the telencephalon of the brain, okay? This, is, this three-fold pattern is repeated because it's all about consciousness and the self. That's what this is all about. People who want to continue to think all these traditions are about something external, 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 go right ahead. Believe what you want and keep being deceived. These are all about the self, and the, the tradition of understanding that we are all one, that we are all in the same situation together, and that we, we are all aspects of the divine. And to recognize that divinity in all others. Period. But, you know, people will insist that's not what it's about just because sick, twisted, psychopathic people have perverted these teachings over time. So, there is no original teachings. It's all one thing. And... You know, that's what I believe, and I'm sticking to my guns no matter what the evidence to the contrary points to. Good luck with that. For those of us who really want to understand something deeper, let's continue. More of, about the G, okay? So I, I also stated it could represent the gate to higher consciousness, okay? Higher consciousness is all, often depicted symbolically as a gateway or portal a stargate, okay, the gate to the gods, the gate to heaven, the gate to higher consciousness, all right? So gate could be another interpretation, all right? What I said at the end of last week's show, and what we're going to explore for a little while tonight, is what this G, the highest meaning of it, in all of my studies at least, that I've come to learn about what this G represents, is known as the generative principle. Now, the generative principle is essentially everything I've been trying to teach since the beginning of all, 
when coming forward into the public. Everything I've tried to teach through my video series, my presentations, my podcasts, all of it. Und the understanding of the generative principle is really the only thing that can save humanity. If we don't understand how we create what we get, good night. And you could tack that on to what the G represents, okay? Joking, of course, but my point here is the generative principle is about causality. Okay? The causal relationships regarding what we experience in what we call life in this three-dimensional space-time continuum. The underlying causal factors, which I said on day one of doing this show, which by the year, that, uh, excuse me, by the way, this is the one-year anniversary of what on earth is happening tonight. I've been doing this for exactly a year. It started on March 30th, 2010. Today's the 29th. This is the one-year anniversary show. So, um, the generative principle. What we get is a result of causal factors that get set into motion. And if we don't understand those causal factors, or in other words, how we indeed created the manifestation called what we got, we don't understand how we did that we're going to continue to create things unconsciously that we don't want the goal here is to learn what creates certain things and what creates other things and then to choose wisely between those creative forces and as we said before and looked at in depth ultimately the only two things that really create or generate is love and fear these are the underlying creative forces that go to work into making the experience that we all collectively share called reality or the truth. Okay? So we need to understand how those two polarities work and how our choices between those two basic polarities ultimately affect everything that comes into manifestation in this reality. That is the generative principle, and it is the underlying hermetic principle that underlies all of the other hermetic principles that we looked at. We looked at those in the presentation about natural law, okay? The seven hermetic principles. The generative principle is the one overarching unifying principle that underlies and unites all of those other seven principles. And if we look at the number eight, it is an infinity symbol, which, mean, which means, ultimately, this is how it always has been, is now, and always will be. It's infinite. It's eternal. It's forever. The generative principle is forever. It always has existed, exists now, always will exist, and everything in creation is bound by it. The end and get over it. Okay? Yet, this is the thing that dark occultists do not want people to understand more than anything else. Above all else, they do not want you to understand how we are the creators of what we are experiencing. They want you to think you're powerless over it. And they have most people fished in hook, line, and sinker to believe that just that that they are powerless over what is created in the world. And this is not so. That's, the, that's one of the biggest lies there is. Probably second only to the biggest lie that there is no such thing as truth. The generative principle is what Freemasonry is ultimately trying to teach people and what dark occultism and dark forms of, free, of masonry, I don't even want to use the word Freemasonry in connection with dark masonry because it is not what Freemasonry is about. It is a perversion and I make the delineation between true Freemasonry or what I call light Freemasonry and dark masonry, okay? Because they're using, utilizing two completely different kind of building materials. Light Freemasonry is building with light, the light of higher consciousness and love. 
Dark masonry builds with walls that it erects, seeing everything as separate. Okay? And it builds through mind control. You're trying to get people to accept authority as truth instead of truth as authority. All right? So, this G ultimately represents the generative principle. And what that generative principle ultimately is, is care. And again, that connects back with the emotional aspect of the self. Care. What we care about, ultimately, to focus our attention upon and then to put our actions toward, is what we're going to get. The end. That's it. That's how it works. If we don't care, we're going to continue to get results we don't want. And again, this is I'm unpopular for saying things like this, but I've said this before on the show, and we'll continue to reiterate it, and I'm going to at the Free Your Mind conference. This is why dark occultists are kicking our rear ends. This is why they're getting what they want, and they're continuing to rule this reality, and why we seem to be running around like chickens with our heads cut off, wandering around blindly, still not understanding why we're not getting what we want, which is true freedom. And why we suffer so much collectively here. It's because dark occultists, the people who have perverted this very tradition, do have a form of care. They do have unity consciousness. They have sick, twisted, demented, psychopathic thoughts. They do care about what they want to achieve and put into manifestation. And then they have the willpower to direct their actions into harmony with those two principles. Therefore, they're unified amongst themselves, which is the most important thing to be unified with in conjunction with the truth. But the universe will reward unity in favor of disunity every time. And that's an unpopular thing to say because what it, basically I'm saying is because they're unified in evil, they're going to continue to, to, to win. And it's true. Their thoughts, their emotions, and their actions are unified, and they act as one, essentially. Our thoughts, emotions, and actions are not unified. We don't act as one, and therefore we don't get what we want. E and even if there's a few people that do align themselves with truth and are trying to explain these principles and concepts to people, unselfishly put knowledge out into the world, they still won't necessarily get what they want unless enough people do it, put it into practice, put it into manifestation. Knowing it is not enough. Doing it is what ultimately matters. And that's what they, the dark occultists, ultimately do. They have all three of these principles in line, in harmony. And cry in your milk over it, folks. Cry in your milk over it. Get as upset about it as you want. That happens to be the case. And the point is not sitting there upset about it. Because that's letting your emotions rule you. Instead of the other way around. The point is, understand how it works and then do something to correct it by first correcting yourself and how you're out of alignment with the generative principle. Come into alignment by bringing your thoughts, emotions, and actions into unison with each other and care truly about understanding truth, putting it out there for other people, and then live in harmony with it. That's putting the generative principle into effect. With, with your thoughts, your emotions, and, above all, your actions. Because as we've said before, you can know this stuff, you can think and feel all you want. Unless you bring your actions into harmony with those two other aspects of consciousness, it does no good. No ultimate good is going to be manifested in the world. Because the people who do bring their actions, even if it's for a dark purpose, into harmony with their thoughts and emotions, or lack of emotions, I should say, okay, they're going to be rewarded for it. The universe is going to grant them what they ultimately desire. So, the, the people that want to think, oh, you know, there's some uh, benevolent force that will never allow that to happen are deluding themselves. There is a benevolent force out there and it wants us to have what we want. But it's always going to reward unity consciousness over oppositional consciousness. And like I said, get as offended or upset about that as you want. That's how it works, ladies and gentlemen. That's how it works. So I'm, I'm explaining to you 
This is why the dark occult rule this planet. This is why people who truly want freedom don't have it. This is the reason, because the bulk of humanity exists in this oppositional form of consciousness where their thoughts, their emotions, and their actions symbolized in this tradition called Freemasonry and in other tradition, occult traditions which we've looked at, okay, are not in unison, are not in unity with each other. That's it. And that is the generative principle or the generator, okay, or genesis, meaning creation. All words that start with G, the generator, okay? We're, in other words, the force that moves everything and of energy, okay? The generative principle, true care. That's what it, this G ultimately represents, the genesis principle. The genesis principle. How we create what we get. And so few of us understand that, that's the reason that the world is in the sorry condition that it's in. Okay, so that's the ge generative principle, or the creation principle, or the care principle. Okay? So, let's move on to an allegory of Freemasonry. Right? So we looked at the compasses and square and the light and the G, all right? Uh, we'll go back to the, the sun as a symbol of Freemasonry. Uh, this, is, this is depicted in image four and five. As I said, that's what the higher aspects of consciousness are symbolized by the sun, okay? The light, shedding light on knowledge. I wanna talk briefly about um, the word Mason, all right? So let, let's look at image number six, which has a whole lot to it, all right? Image number six, there's so much symbolism in it, it's, it's a very complex image, okay, to break down in its fullness. But let's start with that. The word mason, okay, means builder. And that's all it means. It means builder. If you're a mason, you're a builder. And what I've said in my work is that everyone is a mason, whether they you know, identify with the occultic or esoteric aspects of Freemasonry or not, it matters not. Everyone on this planet is a builder of our collective experience through what they think, what they feel, and what they do. The three aspects of consciousness that are used to create what we get here. Therefore, everyone is a Mason. Everyone is a builder. And that will be unpopular. You know, saying that everyone is a Mason. I didn't say everyone is a Lodge Freemason. I said everyone is a builder of their experience. Understand the difference. Therefore, we are all ultimately Masons or builders of what we get. Okay? That's what this word ultimately means. Now, here above this, in this image, you see, to all free and accepted. Okay? This is the distinguishment between two general types of Freemasons. Okay, there's something called operative masonry. Operative masonry, it stems from the builder guilds of the ancient world. Okay, and going back into the Middle Ages and the building of the cathedrals, uh, and we can get into all of those origins. Okay, and you know perhaps we will, but essentially, some of the lodge uh, aspects of Freemasonry. Uh, come down to us in the modern world from some of these building guilds from the ancient past. And it goes right back into the times of, you know, the building of all of the uh, ancient sites, like the pyramids and uh, the, the ancient temples, uh, the, the, all of the wonders of the world, and um, ancient stone building techniques that have been lost to modern history. Okay? They go right into the dawn of antiquity and the dawn of mankind, all right? But more in the modern world, the lodge system takes some of its rituals and some of its um, symbols from the builders' guilds um, around the time of the 
first century AD into and upward into including the Middle Ages and the times of the buildings of the great Gothic cathedrals. These builders' guilds contained masons or very skillful stone workers that had the teachings, held the teachings of how some of these construction techniques were used to build these incredible monuments, okay? And they often would unite with each other because their craft, their art form, was very valuable to people. Uh, kings and emperors and the church would very much seek out these building techniques when they wanted a huge structure completed or built, okay? And therefore, it was a lucrative business. And you had side benefits. Even though there were despotic rulers in areas all over the world that would control through violence the movement of their people, what they were allowed to have, what they were allowed to do, what they were allowed to say, what they were allowed to read or th even think, okay? These masons or builders were granted a modicum of freedom, okay? A level of freedom that wasn't afforded to other people so that they could move around on, on the earth in ways that other people couldn't. They were allowed to travel to certain places without their movement being restricted. They were allowed to... Um, have certain educational materials that were off access to other people because of these psychopathic rulers, okay? So, not only that, but again, since their skills were in such demand, they were well paid. So they became knowledgeable, they gained knowledge of other cultures and areas of the world, and they became wealthy. And this is the origins of the lodge system, again, which I don't want to focus on very much, but just to give a brief background of, and you can read that extensively through any, you know, Google search or uh, checking out some books on Freemasonry itself. So, the this form that represents free, okay, is operative Freemasonry, or a true Mason, a true builder, or what could be said is an esoteric Mason. Okay, somebody that truly has the keys of the craft or of this esoteric tradition in their hands, in their minds, and in their hearts. That's a true free mason. An accepted mason is known as a speculative mason. Okay? And this term was used for people outside of the craft that were taken into its knowledge that were showing that they indeed wanted the knowledge that was held by the original esoteric teachings of Freemasonry. And again, as I said, this goes back to ancient Egypt and even before. All right, So much of the Masonic tradition has Egyptian symbolism within it. All right, Because the, the land known as Chem which is where the Comitian Mysteries came out of, um, this was an initiatory mystery tradition that came out of this region of the world and eventually became Freemasonry. In It's one of its forms. Kabbalah is another one of its forms. And again, it's basically the same teachings. All right? And we'll see. It has shares some of its same symbolism. So, accepted Masonry is also known as speculative masonry, okay? People from who are originally outside of this tradition of teachings that are accepted into them, all right? And this is kind of where the lodge system, you know, in its knowledge, I believe, begins to become degraded. Not that you don't want to share the, these teachings, but when they did this in the lodge system, at least, it really began to open up air into um, the, the knowledge of Freemasonry in, to people who may not have had other people's best interests at heart, people who may not 
really have taken these teachings as anything that are truly fundamental to human freedom, because they don't really care about human freedom, okay, and began to pervert them for their own selfish aims because they could see the potential that a, a system based in hierarchy, compartmentalization, and a certain degree of secrecy would afford them, okay? And these are the dangers of that structure. I'm, a, I'm certainly a proponent that uh, modern-day Freemasonry needs to be restructured. And many people have said this in the past. I mean, you know, uh, I believe it was the Duke of Kent back in the 1700s who said Freemasonry has already been so infiltrated by dark solar cult uh, uh, worshippers, you know, dark occultists in other words, that uh, he felt it should have been dis disbanded altogether, the Lodge system. And indeed, it has been infiltrated. And, I, you know, I, I think I'm making this abundantly clear to people that the modern system is infiltrated by these darker elements. I'm not picking up for the modern Lodge system. I am. I'm telling you, it's infiltrated and it's watered down. This is why I'm trying to teach the original essence of this tradition to the best of my capability. And again, I can't teach every aspect of it. I could put a lot of things out there for people to look into, and I'm going to. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. Okay? However, the only real teacher is your own desire to do your own research. That's the real teacher. I'm not the real teacher. Okay? I could be a, a somewhat of a way shower for people to, to, to open the door and say, here, you want to walk through this door? Well, there it is. And, and connect some dots and, you know, bring some information together for people. And that's all I do. That's it. You need to integrate this into yourself through your own desire to do so in the, in the spirit of truth. That's it. And I think I've said that to a point of almost boredom in the past, but, you know, People need to hear things a lot of times, apparently, because I still get people that listen to a little clip of one show or something, and then, you know, suddenly, you know, as, as Bob Tuscan is, is fond of saying, everybody's an operative, you know. Then, then I become somebody that's trying to pick up for, for people who are doing evil in the world or, or you know, um, saying that, uh, you know, I guess being an apologist, I guess. And that's not what I'm doing here. I'm trying to paint the bigger picture of what has gone on with this tradition. And then encourage people to look into it for themselves to see what teachings they can pull out of it. Alright? So, continuing. So you have operative and speculative forms of masonry. The speculative form, however, ultimately deals with the allegorical aspects and the symbolic aspects. So we're not to say that this is a lesser form of Freemasonry. It's just the words free and accepted. Free alludes to the original operative Masons who basically became rich, powerful, etc. Okay, in the in the in the past, created the modern lodge system and then took other people into it from outside of it or accepted Masons. But speculative Masonry is ultimately what we're teaching here. Okay? The word operative means you have to put it into operation in the world. It has to become integrated with your behavior, with your actions. Okay? So, both of these forms of Freemasonry are important. I'm just trying to get you to understand what these words refer to on this image. So, that's to all free and accepted Mason, Masons. Okay? Uh, we see the compasses and square with the G. We've already looked at that. Okay? And then we have the two pillars, okay, with the third symbolic form of the pillar being represented by this gentleman in the middle riding on a goat, okay, who we'll get to in a moment. Actually, we'll probably get to that in the second hour of the show when we hook up with Oracle Broadcasting. But we have these two pillars, okay. One is called the terrestrial pillar, and one is called the celestial pillar, okay. So we have these depicted, and we have the symbols of the sun and the moon above them, and the all-seeing eye. And we saw that previously when we looked into the religious traditions, into the solar cult, the lunar cult, and then the cult of the stars and planets represented by the all-seeing eye. 
We're going to see this again when we look at the first degree tracing board. Okay? So, um, again, these pillars represent different aspects of consciousness the actions and the emotions. The solar pillar is the actions, the lunar pillar is the emotional qualities. They need to be brought into synthesis with each other or unity such that we are doing that which we think and feel is right. And those things are not in opposition with each other. The middle pillar is represented by this gentleman in the middle there, blindfolded, dressed in what in white, riding on a goat, his name Hiram Abiff. H I R A M Abiff A B I F F. Hiram Abiff is allegorically, okay, the prototypical Freemason. Okay, he is the builder of the Temple of Solomon. One of the three builders, I should say. Okay, and as we saw before, briefly, the Temple of Solomon represents the self. It represents the three aspects of consciousness. It represents thought, emotion, and action, and it represents the body-mind-spirit connection. It also represents the brain, Okay, the lower aspects of the brain represented by the checkerboard floor, the R-complex, base consciousness, okay, which we see here in this image as well. Then we have the emotional aspects of the brain, okay, again, care, the G, the generative principle, true care. And then the higher aspects represented by the gods above, higher level thought, higher consciousness, non-earthbound awareness, or non-physical matter identified awareness. Hiram Abiff, okay, is another, it's a word play. It's a symbol and a word play. We're not talking about an actual person. This is an allegory. And I'm going to read a little bit about the allegory of Hiram Abiff coming up in the second hour. Hiram Abiff, it's, it's a word play for high ram above. Okay? The ram, the symbol of Aries, the beginning of the zodiac. Okay? The ram has symbolic meanings in occultism. We saw it's used symbolically very often. Okay? Ram, of course, being a male sheep. Okay? It's a symbol of courage. All right? It's actually taking action in the world. All right? It's a symbol of force or power. All right? A symbol of divinity. And we'll get into that soon. Hiram Abiff is a symbolic representation of truth. The three builders of Solomon's temple of Hiram, king of Tyre, representing the R-complex of the brain, Hiram Abiff representing the midbrain, who is ultimately building the temple for Solomon, the higher mind, the coming together of the neocortex, sun and moon, soul and moan, soul and moon. Okay? Hiram Abiff is the sacred feminine aspects of the consciousness, the emotions, alignment with truth, the Holy Spirit, the divine mother, so to speak. Okay? Even though he's a male figure, that's what he symbolically represents in this tradition. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit about um, the, the story of Hiram Abiff coming up in the next hour and showing you how this spirit is symbolically murdered. Okay, Because that's what he ultimately represents, is the spirit of man and truth and natural law. So just like Ma'at was the spirit of truth and justice in the Egyptian tradition, in the Masonic tradition, Hiram Abiff represents these concepts. He represents morality, truth, natural law, justice, balance. That's why he sits in the middle between the two pillars. Okay? He rides a goat because he is controlling the base instincts or base passions represented by the goat, a traditional symbol in different pagan cultures and uh, other dark forms of occultism of lower consciousness and 
you know, just uh, the, the instinctual nature of man itself. As we saw when we saw the, uh, the Baphomet symbol that's used by the Church of Satan. That's why they choose the goat as their main symbol. Yes, it's a fertility symbol, but it's also a symbol of the, the darker aspects or the hidden uh, aspects of consciousness that are often wielded as weapons. Okay? So, Hiram Abiff represents truth, balance, harmony, natural law. He's, he rides the goat because he is basically controlling and sitting above the base instincts. Okay? So he has achieved mastery. He is blindfolded. This means he is blind to the worldly aspects of self. He has achieved inner spiritual vision. All right? We saw this in the movie The Matrix. The main character, Neo, becomes blinded to the world. And then he is blindfolded, okay? And then he needs to develop his spiritual vision in order to be able to see The Matrix for what it is. This is, you know, where this is borrowed from, actually. Okay? So, that's where I'll stop for now. I'm going to connect in with Oracle Broadcasting. I'd like to direct everyone's attention to my website now, which is whatonearthishappening.com, because at the stage of um, what I've been doing over many weeks is explaining different rituals and occult, uh, I'm sorry, symbolism and different occult traditions to people from an ec from an esoteric point of view, from an esoteric perspective, meaning the deeper underlying mystery tradition perspective of these different traditions, to help people to get a better understanding of what they really are and what their original intent was before they became perverted and used as weapons against consciousness and against free humanity. Okay, So th we have to become more mature in our understanding that when we're talking about something like Freemasonry or Kabbalah or Tarot or any other occult tradition, we're not talking about one thing. We are talking about an original, deep mystery tradition that is about the self and about human consciousness. And then there is a dark form which has been watered down, perverted over time, okay, to basically be used as a mechanism for control against those that know nothing of the deeper teachings that these traditions hold that are all about the self and the aspects of consciousness that are within us all. Okay, so this is all about self-knowledge ultimately. And I am not attempting to teach what is called Lodge Masonry. This is the esoteric underlying teachings of traditional Freemasonry. Okay? So I don't know how I can make that any more clear. I went on kind of like a rant about that in the first hour. But that is what I am attempting to convey here. So understand the distinction between those two things. Understanding that Freemasonry is not one thing. As I said, I believe, last week, it is all about our choices of building material. Because that's what the word Mason means. Builders. Okay? A builder. Everybody is a builder of our own collective experience in the world of reality that we all create through our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. And uh, builder basically is about the choice of building material that we use to create our reality. Do we use light and truth and harmony with natural law to build what we see around us? Or instead do we use divisiveness? Okay, keeping people in division and seeing each other as separate. Do we erect walls? Okay, so I, in the way I explain it, a light mason or a true Freemason is one that tears barriers down. He tears bricks down, blocks to higher consciousness. Okay, he tears down divisions between people. All right, a, a dark Freemason or what I just call a dark mason. I don't even use the word Freemasonry in connection with the darker tradition. A dark builder, essentially, is one who wants to erect walls and keep people separate and keep people in the dark. Okay, He wants to build barriers within people's consciousness, not to unify their consciousness, but to keep it separated, not only from other people, but most importantly from oneself, Okay, so that we don't understand what we're all about and our deep underlying motivations uh, and our, uh, the aspects of the psyche that we need to work with 
and understand at a deep fundamental level in order to create a better reality. True Freemasonry is about creating that better reality because it is a tradition in which natural law and morality is taught to its members through a system of symbols, allegories, and rituals. And I hear the break music coming up, so we'll take a break right there, folks. Be back. Okay, folks, we are back on What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. I'd like to uh, direct your attention to my website, whatonearthishappening.com. If you click on the Radio Listen link at the top left-hand corner where it says Listen Live, you will be taken to the uh, page that contains the player for the show on Tuesday evening. Underneath the player, under the player, there will be a list of images for tonight's show. We have been looking at these images, and we were on image number six, which is a image of the allegorical um, archetypal original Freemason known as Hiram Abiff. He is there depicted in the center of the image with the Masonic compasses and square behind him, and he is between two pillars, which is a common theme in Freemasonry, with Hiram Abiff himself acting as this middle uh, mediator okay, between these two pillars, uh, a symbolic third pillar, if you will. And this idea of three pillars, or two ways that diverge to the left and right, and then one that is a, a synthesis between them, that is basically acting as a balance point, uh, it comes up over and over again in different occult traditions, and we already saw it previously looking at the tradition of Kabbalah, the Kabbalistic tree of life with its three paths, okay, the path of severity on the left, the path of mercy on the right, and the unifying or uh, synthesis path, which is the path of mildness in the middle. Again, this theme is repeated here in this imagery that basically uh, symbolically depicts some of the symbols uh, of Freemasonry, the ideas of Freemasonry, I should say. Uh, the two pillars are the left and right aspects of the brain. They are the masculine and feminine principles within us all. Okay, They are our emotions, the sacred feminine aspect, and our actions, the sacred male aspect, masculine. Okay, and we need to bring those into alignment with each other, okay, based on our knowledge of natural law and our knowledge of how we create what we get. We need to become knowledgeable about the generative principle, which is what we talked about largely in the first hour. And the generative principle is care, and it's basically the knowledge of how natural law works and caring enough to bring our emotions and our actions into harmony with that natural law such that we create goodness and order in the world. Not through our ignorance of natural law creating chaos, which is basically the situation that we have now. Hiram Abiff, this allegorical uh, master mason, basically represents the knowledge of natural law. He represents truth, goodness, and order because he is the synthesis or the marriage between the masculine and feminine aspects of consciousness or the unifying um, uh, aspect or bringer together of emotion and action. Okay, So he is depicted here clothed in white, representing purity and goodness, and he is blindfolded, meaning that his sight is not of this world. It is a spiritual or inner sight. And we left off in the last hour saying that this was picked up in the allegory The Matrix, a great movie trilogy allegory, okay, which is about spiritual awakening. And the hero, Neo, who ultimately represents the higher part of the brain, the neocortex, okay, 
who needs to understand himself as the one, meaning to bridge the left and right or the masculine and feminine sides of himself so that he can uh, come into harmony with, with his true path, with what he knows he needs to do, becomes blinded later on in that series to the, to the, the physical world or the matrix world. And he develops true spiritual uh, vision. He can see the matrix for what it is, truly for what it really looks like. So that's what this is symbolically saying here. Hiram Abiff is the true spiritual vision. He is truth. He is higher consciousness. He is the spirit of things. The unifying aspect of everything is spirit. Okay, So he could be identified or kind of likened to, he is analogous to the Holy Spirit in the Christian tradition. Okay, the, the, Again, this was the sacred feminine divine mother in other traditions that predate Christianity. But again, the sacred feminine is downplayed because that's all about the emotional qualities. And modern religion is a male dominator, uh, at, uh, a male dominator game. Okay, so uh, the sacred feminine had to be removed and, as we saw, replaced by a dove, the symbol of the dove representing the Holy Spirit in the Christian tradition, the religious tradition. Christian tradition, I should say. Hiram Abiff, okay, there is a legend, there is an allegory to him. Before I get into that allegory, I would like to read uh, some, uh, a brief description of the symbolic meaning of the, the ram, okay, because that's what Hiram Abiff represents. It's a wordplay. Wordplay is often uh, found in different occult teachings, and it is also found in Freemasonry. Hiram Abiff is high ram above. Okay, this is the he is the ram that exists with the gods. He's not really here on the earth as a man. This is a symbol. Okay, it's an allegory. It's not a real person. He was one of the in biblically he was one of the builders of the Temple of Solomon. Okay, because he is the middle or unifying aspect between the base consciousness or the lower physical aspects of consciousness, which are represented by Hiram, king of Tyre, in the, in the Masonic allegory of the building of, of Solomon's temple. Hiram Abiff is the sacred feminine midbrain, which is where our emotions derive from, Okay, the ability of us to feel the repercussions of our actions toward other people. And then Solomon is the left and right brain, or the neocortex, the telencephalon of the brain. Okay, he is the sun and the moon come together, Solomon. Okay, this is an allegory about the building of the brain and the building of the human heart in harmony with natural law and morality. Okay, we have to understand this from a more mature symbolic perspective rather than thinking of these as literal things. Okay, so Hiram Abiff is identified with the beginning of Aries, the beginning of the zodiac, when the sun rises in resurrection at the spring equinox. That's when that happens in Aries. So he is the bringer of the light, okay, into a world of darkness, understanding of natural law and truth, all right? So let's look at some of the symbolic meanings of the ram traditionally, okay? The animal symbolism of the ram is traditionally used to represent power, force, drive, energy, virility, vitality, protection, and fearlessness. All right, these are the qualities that the ram traditionally is used to represent in, in all forms of occultism, basically. Okay? A look into mythology will reveal the ram as associated with many gods over time. And I'll read you a short list of those gods. And you can understand that this is a basic retelling in Freemasonry of different uh, hero myth traditions in which Hiram Abiff represents all of these gods in the Masonic tradition. Okay? A god, if a god amongst the people, okay, wouldn't you agree that these are admirable qualities? So, in other words, Hiram Abiff represents the godlike qualities that we can embody as human beings. And I uh, hear the intro music, and we'll be right back, ladies. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back on what on earth is happening. Before the break, I was discussing Hiram Abif and how that is a wordplay for Hiram above the, the zodiacal sign of Aries as being the uh, b bringer, the returner of the light or the sun into the northern hemisphere to begin spring and the season of rejuvenation and how that is a symbol of spiritual awakening. Okay, so uh, I was reading uh, an excerpt uh, about the symbolic meanings of the ram, and we saw that it is a symbol of power, drive, virility, protection, fearlessness, courage, in other words, okay? So <clears throat> these are admirable qualities, and these are uh, qualities to be cultivated, uh, to become more in harmony with divinity and natural law. So there are some gods that had um, symbolic connections to the ram in the ancient world. Among them was the Celtic god uh, Kernanos, and he was often shown with a ram. Some depictions of him show him seated with a ram-headed snake by his side, and this was a symbolic gesture of renewal and power. In ancient Egypt, the god Amun-Ra took on the persona of Kunum, the creator god who was always depicted with a ram's head. Okay? In Scandinavia, in the Norse tradition, Thor was often uh, connected closely with a ram. And he was fabled to use rams to pull his chariot. Okay, Thor. Other gods that were connected in the ancient world with the strong will Okay, because this is about the will. Hiram Abiff is ultimately about higher will, will with a capital W, will to come into harmony with natural law and the, the ultimate um, drive behind creation, which is ultimately to live in harmony with the laws of nature and the laws of higher morality. That's what it's ultimately all about, achieving self-mastery, mastery over self and only through which can we obtain any level of mastery of nature. It's not even mastery. It would just be really living in harmony with it so that we don't use it as a destructive power, which we're currently doing. Okay? So other gods connected to the strong will of the ram were Zeus, Apollo, and Apollo plays very prominently in Freemasonry. Agni from India. Indra, also an Indian god. Hermes. Um, Roman, okay, um, and, and Grecian, uh, Ea, a god of the Middle East, and Baal, another Middle Eastern or Phoenician god. It is noteworthy that the ram is the first sign of the zodiac as Aries. Hence, it is the symbolic form of impetus, fervor, renewal, virility, and fiery force all connected with the coming of the sun or of the light, okay? This sign embraces the return of the warmth of the sun as the March equinox approaches, okay? So symbolically, that is what we are seeing here when we're seeing the symbol of Hiram Abif, and that is what the story of the building of, the, uh, of Solomon's temple biblically is ultimately about, is building with light, becoming a builder with the light, with the spirit, which Hiram Abiff, as the main architect of the Temple of Solomon, okay, represents. This is a representative, symbolic allegory. Okay? So, let's continue to look at the legend of Hiram Abiff in the Masonic tradition. Okay? So, I'll, I'll read a brief excerpt about this tradition, this legend, and then we'll, we'll analyze it. Hiram Abiff, a widow's son from Tyre. Now we'll get to what the widow's son symbolically means, okay? Skillful in the working of all kinds of metals. Right there, that is symbolic. Working in metals. So he's an alchemist. This is not physical. This is not literal metals, okay? He's supposed to be the builder of the Temple of Solomon and builds with metals. That was his forte. But this is a, an, an alchemical allegory. It's symbolic. Okay? He was employed to help build King Solomon's temple. 
The legend tells us that one day, while worshipping the grand architect of the universe, which we saw that that G in the middle of the compasses and squares symbolically represents, okay, within the Holy of Holies, Hiram was attacked. Hey, Mark. With... Hey, Bob. Hey, Mark. You know what on earth is happening? Bob, are we on? All right, I'm going to assume that we're get going through, so here we go. Um, so the, the allegory of Hiram Abiff is what we were delving into, and we were at the point where I was reading things about uh, the legend of Hiram Abiff. Okay, so he is accosted by three ruffians, as the legend goes, and this is done at three areas of the Temple of Solomon while it is being built. The first is the East Gate, the second the South Gate, and the third the West Gate, where Hiram is finally slain. And I'll, we'll look into this symbolically, okay? The, the East Gate is where the sun rises. The South is the direction that the sun takes its trek through the sky during the day. It does not go into the northern part of the sky, but the southern part of the sky is where it makes its arc in the northern hemisphere. Okay, And then it, it sets in the west, or the sun dies for the day, and then he resurrects to new life the next day to repeat the cycle all over again. So the three ruffians... Yeah, right? Mark Passio, what on earth is happening? You're live. Uh, let's see if the connection's any better now. How are you, Mark? Bob, can you hear me? Yes, and I think the connection's much better now. Great, fantastic. Okay, so we were looking at the... All right, legend. well, let's not waste any more time. I'll let's jump right into it. Thanks, Bob. We were looking at the legend of Hiram Abiff, and we were looking at uh, how he was attacked by three ruffians called Jubala, Jubalo, and Jubalum at the Temple of Solomon. Okay? They attacked him at the... Uh, um, the east gate of the temple, then the south gate, and then the west gate. So the first, uh, the first ruffian, Jubala, attacks him at the east gate, then uh, Jubalo at the south gate, and then Jubalum at the west gate. This is symbolic of the sun's path through the sky, and it's rising and setting each day. Okay, so the east gate is where he rises. The eastern horizon, the sun comes up, the light, which Hiram Abiff represents. The south gate represents its zenith, because the sun at its zenith, from the perspective of those living in the northern hemisphere, always makes a trek through the southerly portion of the sky, not the north. Okay, This is also why there are three candles in Freemasonry's altar, one at the east, one at the south, one at the west, but not one in the north. Okay. So the west, then, is the death place of the sun, the setting place of the sun each day. And symbolically, that's where Hiram is slain, and then he, you know, uh, resurrects the next day, like the sun resurrects to new life at the beginning of each day and repeats the cycle all over again, okay? So uh, these three ruffians, Jubala, Jubalo, and Jubalum, uh, attack Hiram, okay? So they are demanding the lost word, okay? the master word, the, the master mason's word, and it's supposed to be the secret name of God. Hiram Abiff refuses to divulge uh, this deeply held secret of the, the builders, and therefore he is attacked by these three ruffians. The first ruffian, named Jubala, strikes Hiram across the throat with a 24-inch gauge, which is another t Masonic tool, symbolically. Okay? And... Well, there's the uh, outro music for this break, and uh, we'll be right back after these messages, folks. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back on What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. Before the break, we were delving into the legend of Hiram Abiff in Freemasonry. I'm going to continue that. So, we looked at the ruffians attacking Hiram Abiff, and this is representative of 
the, uh, the sun's trek through the sky and its subsequent death in the west, okay? The first ru ruffian named Jubala struck Hiram across the, th across the throat with a 24-inch gauge. This represents um, stopping speaking the truth or not speaking the truth at all. He hits him in the throat chakra, okay? So I've often said that the universe is spoken into existence. Other people have said that the um, that the uh, <clears throat> um, other people have said that uh, history will reward those with the loudest voice. You may may have heard it said that way, but essentially, we um, we need to put the truth out there in order for people to understand it, grasp it, and then live in harmony with it. So it needs to be spoken. So that's what that's symbolic of. The second ruffian named Jew Below struck Hiram's breast over the heart with a square. Okay? So this represents not feeling or caring. Okay? And he hits it with the square, which is what represents the lower base instincts or the base passions, the lower consciousness. And this symbolically represents apathy is a way to kill the light okay within us the third ruffian named jubilum struck hiram upon the forehead with a gavel okay or a setting mall in some tellings of the story okay where hiram fell dead all right so this he is struck in the head which is the pl place of thoughts so this is about knowing the truth this is ignorance, in other words, okay? So the three ways that the light is put to death is through apathy, through ignorance, and then through laziness, not then putting it out into the world, okay? Or the courage to speak, not having the courage to speak, which is cowardice, all right? These are the murderers of the, the light. These are the murderers of righteousness and, and morality and goodness, basically. All right, so Hiram, having been killed, was carried out the east gate of the temple and buried outside Jerusalem. Early the following morning, King Solomon visited the temple, found the workmen in confusion because no plans had been made for the day's work since Hiram was the chief architect. Okay, Fearing the evil had befallen Hiram, King Solomon sent out 12 fellow craft masons to look for Hiram. Again, the number 12... Right? Symbolic of the 12 signs of the zodiac, Hiram Abiff representing the light or the sun. Okay? He's the widow's son. All right? He is the Masonic Christ, in other words. Okay? It is just another retelling of the same story that we looked at when we, in depth, covered astrotheology and religion as astrotheology. Okay? So, um,. What I'm attempting to get people to explain, to, to understand by explaining this, is the same thing that I was when I was explaining astrotheology. Get past that to the deep underlying tradition about consciousness that it is attempting to teach. Okay? So, fearing evil had befallen him, he sends out 12 fellow craft masons to look for Hiram. That's symbolic because the fellow craft is all about care. And you have to care enough to seek out. The, the light or the truth in order to ever find it, okay? King Solomon himself accompanied the three masons who journeyed toward the east. So he sent out three in each direction. This is symbolic of the seasons, and he goes toward the east, which is symbolic of the rising sun, okay? And it's also symbolic of going toward the east, which is the symbol of Aries, high ram above, high ram abif, okay? And it's symbolic of the resurrection of the light or of truth. Okay? So, having finally located the gra grave of Hiram Abiff, Solomon and his fellow Masons exhumed the body. A search was made for the Master's word, but all that was found was the letter G, which we talked about extensively in the first hour of the show. Okay? The generative principle or true care, meaning that that was still present to some degree. Finding the lost word, a layment went up, O oh Lord my God, is there no help for the widow's son? And we'll understand what this cry of distress means in a moment. Okay? They first took hold of Hiram's body with the Boaz grip of the first degree. This failed to achieve its purpose. This means emotion alone will not ultimately achieve 
the purpose that you are seeking, okay? You need to combine it. Right? Then they reposition their hold upon Hiram's body using the Joaquin grip of the second degree. This also failed to achieve its purpose. Now, this represents having developed um, the will to act alone. Okay? The Joaquin pillar represents the ma male principle. Okay? That also fails to accomplish its purpose. Solomon finally raises Hiram from the dead using the third degree grip of the master mason. Okay? Now, this represents putting all of them together, our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions in unity with each other, okay? The place of higher knowledge. Ultimately, the grip that finally raises him is Solomon's grip, which represents symbolically true knowledge of oneself. This represents deeper esoteric spiritual knowledge, okay? represented by the coming together of the left and right brain or the awakening of the all-seeing eye. Okay? The, the coming together of the masculine and feminine forces within the self. All right? And this is also symbolically represented by the five points of fellowship, which is a Masonic greeting, which represents the coming together of earth, air, water, fire, and ether, or spirit. Okay? Basically, the most important of which is the spiritual aspects. Okay, the five points of fellowship uh, is what he raised him with as well, and by uttering in Hiram's ear the phrase mahabon, which is often used in conjunction with the five points of fellowship, uh, grip and stance, in order to uh, identify oneself as a, a Mason, uh, a Freemason. So, in in thus doing so. Solomon had raised Hiram a bit from the dead. This represents the symbolic raising of the light and of truth from the dead. The spirit is what is being raised. Okay, and we'll look at this extensively through the symbols of Freemasonry over the coming weeks. So, what I want to um, essentially look at here was that Hiram is killed by the failure to use our thoughts. Okay, intelligence. He is also killed by the fail failure to care, which is apathy. And he is also killed by the failure to speak and act, which is, um, which is uh, cowardice, okay, not having the courage to actually speak and act. And then the failure to do so is the lack of will, okay, not having it, will. It seems to me, Mark, that you're describing the same elite pigs that we talked about all the time. That's ultimately the dark occult and the people who live under their mind control. They are the murderers huh. of the light of this world. And we have to well, understand up next week this tradition what I from, in my... from a symbolic one. Bob, thank you so much. And hopefully we won't have any more technical difficulties next week. Uh, check out whatonearthishappening.com and freeyourmindconference.com. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Mark, thank you very much, and, and I look forward to always having you on. And uh, we'll work out all the technical glitches, and I hope uh, everybody could get past that. And if you missed any of his show, go back to whatonearthishappening.com or the intelhubradio.com, which is our website. Tomorrow we'll be doing a full report on the nuclear situation as well as a uh, report on uh, the Middle East. And uh, we've been covering these these two topics, it seems like, for the last couple weeks almost now, and I'm getting tired of it. Uh, I don't know if you are as well. So it was nice to hear Mark uh, with a refreshing you know, talk on some of the deeper aspects of the occult. And I am looking forward to joining Mark in Philadelphia at uh, the Free Your Mind Conference. FreeYourMindConference.com is the website for that, and that's April 9th and 10th. Uh, join us if you can, and uh, so much more to come. Uh, this week on the Intel Hub radio show, and uh, you're not going to want to miss any of it. Coming up next on Oracle Broadcasting, Lee Rogers, Live Free or Die. And I always look forward to hearing Lee's take on the daily uh, news and uh, his uh, website, Rogue Government, as well as Blacklisted News, the IntelHub.com, and so much more. All friends of the show. I guess the intelhub.com is obviously a friend of the show. Anyways, we'll see you in tomorrow night, same time, same place.